Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Meeting of the Alamance County Commissioners. And if you would, before we begin, uh, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privileges you have given us here in this country to come mm -hmm. and govern our country. God, thank you for the employees that are working for Alamance County. We have so many today. Bless their lives. Be with them. And as we go into the Christmas season, let's remember the meaning. And be with our servicemen, law enforcement, and all first responders during this season. And all the time, actually. Thank you, Lord, for what you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First thing we're going to do this morning, we have a number of employees that uh, have put in a lot of time with Alamance County. So the commissioners, we're going to go down front and as we call your name, if you just come by, we'd love to shake your hand and thank you for your service, okay? <clears throat> Service. Adrian Day. 
Signed up, but Thomas didn't make it, so <coughs> that's the end of that. <laughs> Commission response to that, I guess, would be pretty good too, right? Okay. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask for approval of the agenda. So moved. Thanks, Bill. Second. Thank you, Amy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Was that the, the agenda? Yeah, approval of the agenda. Uh, Brian, were you going to add? Something about um, uh, yes, I was going to actually I was going to talk about it under county manager report okay. and ask for action uh, from the board of the county ma uh, county manager report concerning the cardinal invasion. All right, consent agenda. Is there anything there that uh, anyone would like to pull? Or? I move approval of a the consent agenda. Okay, thanks, Bob. A second. Thank you, Amy. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right, next on the order of business is board organization. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to our county manager, and we will proceed with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, it's required by North Carolina General Statute 153A-39 that every December uh, the board elects a chairperson and a vice chairperson at your organizational meeting, which is this meeting. So at this time, uh, I would open the floor for nominations for I chairperson. I nominate Amy Gailey, chairman. Do they require seconds? Yes. Okay, I'll second that. So we have a nomination for uh, Commissioner Gailey for chairperson and a second. Are there any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Eddie Boswell. Is there a second? You can second. I can second it. I, get, I yes. don't know. This you can. Is, okay. Okay, I'll so second. we have uh, two nominations and two seconds. Uh, nomination for chair, uh, Commissioner Gailey for chairperson and a nomination for Commissioner Boswell for chairperson. So at this time I will close, uh, hearing no other nominations, we'll, we'll close that uh, uh, nomination time. Um, so we have two nominations on the floor. All those in favor of Commissioner Gailey for chairperson, I'd ask you to raise your hand so we can count. Let the vote show we have three votes for Commissioner Gailey. All opposed? No. Okay, that, uh, that solves the nom uh, nominations for chairperson. Uh, Ms. Gailey will be chair of the board. Congratulations, I will slide over and move into that chair.
turn it over to you. <laughs> it was a close move there, wasn't it, Thomas? All right. Ms. Daly, the uh, process for vice chair will be yours. Thank you. If I could just, um, if I could just take a minute um, to say a couple of things. Uh, appreciation for being given this honor, this responsibility. Um, first thing I would like to say is just to recognize the the two ladies who paved the way before me to be a member of this board. Um, Ann Vaughn was the first person to be elected as a county commissioner, a lady woman to be elected county commissioner in Alamance County, and then she was followed by Linda Massey, and then Linda was the first chairperson of this board. And um, people might say, well, why are you recognizing them? They weren't Republican. They're not from your party. But I think that's the kind of attitude that people in our country are really tired of. Um, those are great women, and they left uh, high heels to fill. And I hope that uh, that I do them credit by continuing in their in their service and their tradition. Also, I want to say that I appreciate and enjoy the gentlemen that I work with. That um, there's a lot in the news today about men who misbehave at work. You can't get away from it. It's everywhere. And I just wanted to say that publicly to say that uh, I don't think that these gentlemen have treated me any better. They haven't treated me any worse than they would have any other person. And I think that is a credit to their mamas and the fact that they were raised right and also maybe a little tip of the hat to Linda and Ann because they got them broke in good for me. So <laughs> appreciate that. All right. They knew better. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for this honor and um, I'm going to try my best to do a good job. So now we're going to elect a, a vice chair, um, and I guess we're going to open the nominations to vice chair. And I would like to make the nomination of Bill Ashley to be vice chair of the board. I'll second that. All right. Are there any other nominations? All right. Hearing none, we'll close the nominations. And all in favor of uh, Bill? Lashley being vice chair, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Awesome. So thank you, Bill, for continuing in that service. All right, next on our agenda is the review of the bonds of public officials. So uh, Mrs. Susan Evans, if you would uh, please uh, help us with that. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, commissioners. Um, before you is the annual approval and review of the bonds for the public officials as required by North Carolina general statute section 58-72-20. There are five uh, bonds that need to be approved by the board and it does require a motion. Are these minimum bonds <coughs> or uh, numeric, I mean a dollar recommended by the state or what, right? Yes. They're, they're recommended <coughs> by the county commissioner. You set the amount of the bond, but this is the amount that we've decided is adequate for Alamance County for the past several years. And you need to increase any of them, in your opinion? No, Susan's not going to run off for you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I move approval of the bonds. I'll second that. Great. Uh, so all in favor of approving the bonds, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay. Alamance Burlington School System presentation on performance contracting. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Gavin, Mr. Lashley, on your appointments. I uh, look forward to working with you over the next uh, next year anyway, as I do all of you. I really appreciate what y'all do each and every day. Uh, we're bringing before you, I've got Andy Nightingale with me, uh, from uh, performance contracting from Brady Train. Some of you have heard several presentations about performance contracting and how we can take money that you already provide us and do some major upgrades with um, like electrical or um, energy consuming devices in our schools um, but we're bringing them before you to get a better understanding as a school system we have vetted this we've vetted contracts we've looked at this has been a year-long process I've been with these guys uh, so we're to the point of saying either we need to do it or we're going to have to think of a different way which a different way would be uh, not cost-effective but uh, I'm gonna turn it over to mr. Nightingale and let him do his presentations. And I've got several folks in the audience and we'll try to answer any questions that come up. 
Thanks. So I'm here today to answer any questions you have, any concerns you have about this project. I've got a slide deck here. Uh, I'm not going to read bullet points off the slide deck. If you guys have any questions as we're going through, stop me, ask questions. I'm happy to answer them. Any of your questions, if I can't answer your question, we'll get you an answer before the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. <coughs> no, I um, so the project goals is to convert the wasted energy and operational efficiencies uh, through guaranteed energy savings. And what that means is we're going to come in, we're going to find ways to reduce your energy costs so that you can use your existing operating budget to fund a project that would be financed over probably a 10 to 15 year term. Um, so we take the money that you're already spending and pay into the power company and we use that money to fund these improvements, capital improvements in your facilities. This project will address many of your facility needs. Um, later, in one of the later slides, I have some specifics about which schools and what we're doing in the different schools. Um, just one more thing about that. This is really early in the process. Um, the next stage of this process is the investment grade audit. That's part of what uh, the, you know, the approval we're looking for is to move into that next phase, the investment grade audit. So we've looked at preliminary um, energy conservation recommendations. We've got a pretty good idea of what the savings are going to be, but really all of that's going to be defined further. The scope, the cost, the savings will be defined further in this next phase of the project. And we're going to work closely with Todd and his team. We're not, we're not coming in and saying, here's the scope that you need to do in your schools. We're working with Todd and his team to get their feedback on what really needs to be done in these schools. Where are you, where's the starting point as far as where you're going to, what you're going to start on? The light, lights, replacing lights or? Yeah, I'll get to that in one of the okay. next slides. Okay. Um, but yeah, lighting would, lighting would probably be the first piece of it that would happen and it would go the quickest in the process. Um, one of the big benefits of energy performance contracting is it doesn't require additional appropriations. Like I said earlier, you're taking the money that you're paying to the utility companies, you're putting that towards paying for financing the project. <coughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, going through this and, and you guys can the, the benefits of this, again, are you're using your existing funds. So there's two, um, there's two pieces to this. There's the uh, performance contract, which would be a, an agreement, a contract between Alamance and Train. Not the uh, county or the school system? Uh, it would be with the county, correct? No, it would be with the, the agreement would be between the school system. <clears throat> yeah. Is that correct, Brian? No, the financing requires county approval. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But, but okay. Are we so a it would be with the, the agreement or just approving it? It would be with the school system. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and there's two pieces of it. There's the performance contract, which we would hold, and then the finance would be separate through a third party, and we would work with you to handle issuing the RFP and helping to get all that through. And these are the two, this is the two uh, forms of legislation that allow this to happen. T a typical project, one of these projects is usually a 15 year term. So it's financed over 15 years. Um, again, I, I don't need to go through this it's just reiterating what I've already said. You're using your existing money and putting that to use towards capital improvements with your operating budget. We typically see between 15 to 30 percent energy reduction. Um, we've looked at all of your utility bills and uh, a lot of your schools are already performing really well. Um, so the opportunity, we've, we've tried to focus on the opportunities that 
Uh, we saw where the, the schools are a little bit of outliers from some of the rest. <clears throat> the schools that are operating well, we're just focusing on the very quick payback items like lighting and water improvements and not going to spend a lot of time and resources developing a real detailed, uh, you know, doing a lot of engineering work that's going to cost more money. So to uh, Todd and his team's credit, you guys are doing better than most school systems as far as energy consumption. Um, interest rates are really low right now. Another <coughs> huge benefit to doing one of these projects right now. We've seen rates that are around 3% recently, um, even some that were a little less than that. Uh, so it's really a good time uh, as far as you know, the financing side of it for this type of a project. Utility rebates are also going to be a part of this. And, and we haven't really, Brad, have we, we haven't quantified what we think that's going to be yet. Or? We, we've uh, estimated it, yeah. But do you remember what that about. number was? Um, I All right. It, it could be 500000 It could be a million dollars that the utility company puts towards uh, this project because you're doing energy improvements to your facilities through their rebate program. So that $11.7 million estimated project size is before the rebate? It is. Absolutely. So you wouldn't be financing that total amount. The rebate could come off of that and you'd finance the difference. And I had another question. It, yeah. You're estimating annual savings of eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's correct. What um, What's the estimated um, debt service for financing eleven point seven million dollars? Yeah, in, you know, um, principal and interest payments. Um, it would be you know somewhere around three percent over fifteen years. So, um, do you have a calculator? Oh. We can get that answer. You know, 850,000 times 15. Well, you have. <coughs> I mean, that, more, it's, it, it's. It's more. Yeah, right, it's right. More complex than that. It is, it is. That's just a rough, you know, <coughs> close. Or, until we know what the finance rates are, we're, we can't say for sure. But, but, but we would anticipate, I guess the point is, is that um, those payments would be less than the savings each year. Exactly, okay. yes. It, it, it's going to be. So. We guarantee the energy savings, and that's something that I haven't spoken on yet. We guarantee the energy savings. So if we say that you're going to save $850,000, we probably think it's going to be closer to 900 or somewhere around there, because if there's a shortfall in what we're guaranteeing, we write you a check for the difference so that you're insured to make those finance payments, either through energy savings or through energy <coughs> savings and a check that we write you. I know that's true. I was energy manager for a textile company, and uh, I was responsible for doing all this. And it does pay back high dividends. Yeah, it surely does. Yep, it's the best way to go. Well, that's another good point: is that we try to be conservative with our energy calculations <laughs> because we don't want to write checks. <laughs> so, um, and we we typically hit our guarantee. There's been a few times where we haven't, and we've written a check. What kind of water conservation measures do you use? So we typically look at um, on the older systems that are much higher. It, it's similar to what we would do on lighting. You know, the older systems that you have are going to be a higher flush rate uh, than a brand new fixture would be. So it would be changing out fixtures, putting in new flush valves that would do the same thing at a lower usage. So this includes the, the parts, like the, the fixture itself, as well as the labor to switch it out? Everything that we do is going to be turnkey, mm -hmm. from doing the engineering to the construction to the verification afterwards. Everything is turnkey. We're not going to give you a product, and you've got to go and have somebody install it. Sorry, I should have had that up. <laughs> I was wondering where that <laughs> you was. You were already there. <laughs> so, yeah, we're estimating somewhere around $850,000 a year in annual energy savings. Um, and then that should fund around $11.7 million in project. This I already talked about. It's two separate contracts. The performance contract would be between Alamance Schools and Train, and then there would be a separate finance 
agreement. So this is what we would be looking at doing as far as scope of work. And, and again, this is early in the process. We'd work closely with Todd and his team, and it could change from, from what we have up here now. But in general, this is what we're looking at. Lighting in probably every building. The lighting usually has a really quick payback, and um, there's also good incentives, rebates from the utility company on lighting. Automatic, automated controls, um, it provides, it, it, it does several things for you. In, in addition to energy conservation, uh, it provides a lot more visibility for the maintenance staff. They can much more quickly identify where there's temperature issues and get those addressed uh, quicker as well. So it provides a lot more visibility for Todd and, Todd and his team. How am I doing on time, guys? Right. Uh, equipment replacement. Um, we're looking at uh, several schools. That's primarily HVAC equipment. Um, it, it isn't, I don't think it's HVAC for the entire school, but it's where we saw that there was aging equipment that will need to be replaced in the near future. Um, those are the schools that we identified. And, and I believe, we, Todd, you and your team gave us um, where <coughs> gave us a list of where there were uh, issues or yes, concerns. Uh, we provided already trained with a list of we start talking about controls. What are our older controls? Where do we have the least control of our buildings? Uh, we provided a list of equipment replacement. What we see in the very near future as far as chillers or boilers uh, either going out or becoming so cost ineffective that it's time to switch those out. So we've used what we know to provide this initial <coughs> list. As they go through this initial grade this, uh, audit, they may identify other items. And they may tell us that some of the items that we have chosen are not ready to be traded out or changed out of maybe a different avenue. So this is a collaborative process. It's been a collaborative process for about a year now. <clears throat> you know, the biggest benefit we see of the whole program is one, we're using the money you're already giving us, making an investment in our schools, improving the performance of our buildings. And we're going to continue with that savings until this is paid for. And then it will continue their own, which is, you know, in line will save the district money. Now, we have no control of rates, and that's where we'll start talking about final resolution after we get this uh, investment grade audit, because you know, if your power goes up 20%, we can't continue to show those kind of savings, but that's what the resolution will take place of. <clears throat> I know the question about the, how much savings and how much the loan is. The loan will not over the savings. So if, that, if we show that we can save $850,000 a year, and it'll pay for a $12 million project, we'll do a $12 million project. If that's what we need. If we want to need $9 million, we'll do $9 million. But if it only shows that we can only pay for a $9 million project, we'll scale the project back down and take the highest priority, such as lighting. You all know lighting is very expensive, not only to T12 lighting, not only to maintain, but also to <laughs> get rid of the bulbs, the ballast. I mean, all that is extremely expensive now. So there's a cost even when they burn out. So, you know, if it will save us enough money, we're going to do all we can do. Because we want to make this a one-shot deal to, you know, improve the performance of our schools. If you've been in any of our buildings, such as uh, I'm picking on Williams bottom floor, we put LED lighting in there. It went from a dungeon to a very bright place. You might ought to explain what a ballast is. A lot of, a lot of people don't know. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. A ballast. Each your old fluorescent lighting. I'll have a ballast in it. The ballast is what controls the power going out to the tubes. That causes the fluorescent tubes to light up. Well, some of your old ballasts have mercury in them, some of them have lead in them. So it has to be specially, we have to use a special company to uh, do away with them. You can't just toss them in the trash can like they did years ago. Fluorescent tubes, you can no longer just toss them in a trash can. You have to properly dispose of them. The average year of lighting is 10 to 12 years on LEDs. So that bulb, you know, if you go 10 or 12 years without having to get rid of any ballast or bulbs, there's another little savings that's coming back on the other side of that. So, you know, our goal is to make those changes as quick as we can. And, you know, we can come to you and say we need a million and we can do this little project and we can do this little project. By the time we get to the last project, we got to go back to the first project. Like this, we can do all the projects at one time. It is turnkey, as Brad uh, provided for us here, as Brad and Andy's provided for us. It's turnkey. It will not cost us any additional work other than this overseeing. Now, I know they've talked a lot about, and I'm sorry, Brad. Andy. Andy, excuse That's me, okay. gosh. I'll get you right in a second. Uh, sorry, Andy. Uh, I know we've talked about this guaranteed savings. We also have an engineer, Lockwood Locker & Associates, out of Pembroke. 
worked as our engineer. He not only will help us oversee the project in the sense of money, is it valuable, is it purposeful to do, he also has to redo the calculations every year to verify that Brady's calculations are correct. So that's a safeguard that the school system puts in place to verify that what Brady says is correct at the end of the day. Todd, having attended the, uh, most of your meetings and yes, hearing this presentation, I believe that's a statutory requirement it to is. have that engineering firm oversee yes, it, it is. an external engineer. Yes, it is. And yeah, that's just a safeguard that's um, so that's put the, in that's our, that's our legislation. safeguard, your safeguard, that what you're hearing is correct and accurate. Yeah, the new commodes have less water usage, which will save money. Uh, the big commodes probably triple the, the amount of usage on water. Yep. And a lot of our homes. Yep. Correct. That's that's a savings. You have some small savings yep. in the picture, but it is a savings. And you know, where we can find that savings is we can actually invest in something additional uh, that would benefit our schools and our facilities. Thanks, Tom. Yep. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, again, with this being a preliminary stage, there are a lot of additional things that we'll be looking at during the next step in the process. This is just a list of some of those things that we'll also be looking at uh, in the next phase. So these are the next steps in the process. Advertising of the uh, Energy Service Company Award, which is Brady Train. Is that has that already been determined? Because at one point you were engaged to do a certain part of the project and it was still going to be open for other firms to be able to be the final so, awardee. Uh, you want to address okay. that? We, uh, we put RFQ out. We had uh, six companies to show up for the initial meeting. We had one company to respond, which was Brady. Uh, so statutory requirement says we put it back out again. We had to, we had to have at least two companies show up on a repeat. We had two companies show up. Again, Brady Train was the only one who has submitted. Uh, so we have gone to the point now that the contract, the ESCO contract, is sitting on our board agenda and consent at this moment. Uh, our attorneys have looked at it, you know, they've done their due diligence to make sure what everybody says is what everybody says. So uh, if everything goes smoothly today, uh, that award will be announced as of the morning. I, I didn't mean to challenge Brady because it's a very reputable company. I was just asking for well, you that's a, the process. That's I'm sorry, we should great have question. Still the process out yeah. on the front side. Yep. Um, I don't need to read through all of this. This is just some of the next steps. You know, we would again go into the investment grade audit after this. It's probably somewhere around a six month process to get through that. That's doing all the energy calculations, putting together scope of work, getting pricing pulled together. And then from the investment grade audit, we would move into the energy services agreement, which is the contract, the performance contract. Um, and then we actually start implementing the work. And to your question earlier, the, the way that it typically goes is the lighting and water gets done first because they go the quickest. They'll be in and out in you know, a few months, four or five months. The rest of the project may be a year-long construction period. Uh, controls. And the equipment replacement are typically about the same amount of time. They take usually the entire uh, schedule of the construction phase of the project. Do you use subcontractors? Do you bid out some of this work to actually? We do. We do. And uh, we try to use as much local subcontractors as we can, as, as long as uh, their experience and background fits the scope of work that we're trying to implement. Um, if you all and Todd have recommendations on subs that you've used before based on the work that we're doing we're happy to use any local subs that you recommend so I guess one of my uh, concerns was the, um, the the cost that's being paid for these improvements the, other than what you've already done in bidding to manage this work there's still we're not going to overpay because it's going to be done on a we, bid we're bidding process. everything out and the state requires through this process open book pricing all of that was submitted as part of our response and it shows in there here's what our uh, soft costs are here's what our markup is here's what our profit is it, it's a totally open book pricing and we bid it out to everyone thank you great are we um doing a vote on this today 
we are voting to approve this, uh, but it sounded like the school board has a little more. I think, yeah, I think what, <coughs> what we're looking for is a kind of consensus for us to move forward, because we'll have to make an investment tonight that will um, be part of the contract, but if we move forward, make that investment, and then we don't move forward, then we swallow that investment we're making tonight. So simply a, a consensus for, uh, for us to move forward. So, so that's like a really good question before we do anything sure, else. Of course. I see on, the, on your uh, website that you uh, one of your big projects were uh, School system, Ory County, and I assume that's Myrtle Beach. Ory County is, is o Myrtle Beach. Ory. <laughs> so you must be from there if you I'm said Ory, Ory, because that's yeah. how they say it. Well, the H is silent, it's a French word, and yeah. accents on the reef. Yeah. I have to always point Most that out. Most people don't say it that way. Well, like, Ory. They even have it in a fight song in one of the high schools down there. <laughs> Nobody knows how to pronounce our name, but we do. Yeah. Uh, but you list that as a big pro your, one of your biggest projects. Can you give us some stories of what you've done there? Yeah. So. That's a little unique. It's not an energy performance contract like this one. Um, that project is that we were working on is with a partnership uh, with a developer that builds energy positive school systems. So they're building, these. this is five new school systems that they are putting solar panels on and the schools are going to produce more energy than they consume. Um, so our role in that, uh, we were involved in uh, the design process and selecting the mechanical controls, uh, integration system. Um, we were a really big part of the design. Because we have the energy background, uh, the partner that we have on this project uh, really leaned heavily on us to help them decide what they needed to do to make it an energy positive school. Because um, you can't just go in and add solar panels to the building. Uh, it, if you just design the building the way you typically do and it's not really efficient, it's going to require a lot more solar panels to make it energy positive. So we made the building very, very energy positive. I mean, I mean very efficient so that we could reduce the uh, solar panels that we're putting on there. Um, three of the schools are open now um, and two of them uh, should be wrapping up January or February, I believe. Have you done year. any work uh, in the, uh, I think your office, you have one in Greensboro, right? We do. Yeah, and uh, in Wilmington, I believe, and yep. Charlotte? Uh, we don't have a Charlotte yeah. office. Or Durham, do. Durham, excuse me. Uh, yeah, it's just outside of Durham. Yeah, have you done any work for uh, on the uh, energy issue uh, with any other public school systems in the state? Yes. Who, who are? Yes, uh, we've done a project just like this with Hope County Schools. Hope? Hope. Yeah, that's where they had the energy savings uh, panels there. <clears throat> yeah, Hope also built one of those energy positive schools as well. We weren't a part of the, it's Sandy Grove Middle School in Hope County. We weren't a part of that project. We got involved with the developer after he had built that one. Uh, but they've also done one of those schools as well. Um, Durham Public Schools, we've done a project with. Um, who else, Brad? Uh, several community colleges. Um, as far as school systems. Yeah, I'm trying to run down the list. We, we can provide you with a list mm -hmm. of all the school systems. So we're satisfied with. with their track records yes, uh, with yes, sir, public schools. We, we've got them, we've talked references, we've talked to contractors, we've spoken with architects, <laughs> uh, engineers, you name it, even engineers we've got now been involved with the project with Brady, um, so yes, we have vetted them very well and are satisfied with their performance. What they say they can do, they will be able to do. So I, I like this concept because I remember learning in graduate school, when you're considering a capital project like this, you have to think of it in two um, mutually exclusive phases. One is, it, is the investment, regardless of what the cost is, is the investment worth it from a return on the investment? And so if we're going to invest $11.7 .7 million, are we going to have enough of a return uh, on that to make it worthwhile to spend the 11.7? And then the second part is what's the best way to finance it? And, and they're really two independent decisions. And so our choices in financing something like this, I mean, we could include it in the bond issue or we could do this. Uh, if you did it in the bond issue, that means there's another 
well, first of all, the bond would have to pass, so that could be a little risky. Um, and also, um, there's, there would be a delay. And the delay, any delay, we're just spending out more money. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a cost, cost to delay. Every day, yeah, so every day that we don't do something right. like this is costing uh, so, uh, yeah. I really, uh, this is a nice way to do it without ha having to do uh, a property tax increase to pay for it. And, uh, Your ex yeah, yeah, That's going to pay for well, itself. Yeah, right. It and and three percent is a good rate. Now three, maybe a uh, Susan. I don't know what bonds are going That's for these days, say. but the bonds might be a little less. But but again, right. there's a cost of waiting, and there's upfront costs in issuing bonds too. Exactly. Uh, so um, so I think I, I'm really in favor of this. Yeah. Yeah, and if you decide not to do the project, you're still going to continue to pay that eight hundred fifty thousand right. right. that we're right. trying to save. That's a given, anyhow. Anyway. So yeah. Does the school system have central thermostats? Central, as in we, uh, <coughs> we have controls in the central office or in our maintenance shop where we can control uh, temperatures in the buildings. Uh, some of the ones up here for listed are pneumatic controls, which pneumatic controls are very expensive to maintain for one thing. But also the to create any type of consistency throughout the building is very difficult. So that's really the main controls that we're looking at. We do have controls that most of our the biggest majority of our uh, HVAC is controlled through our central office. And I don't believe that the, the cost of doing it under this financing arrangement would be any different than if we did it through a bond issue, for example. Other than maybe the, that the external engineer, the cost of the external engineer wouldn't be required if you're going to do it. Well, it wouldn't be but, required, but I feel like you know, but, we probably won't but, yeah, for our safety anyway and our security. Well, and there's probably some savings that he, he could. Uh, uncover anyways right. that to pay for himself so super does anybody have any more questions or comments I'm good with it I think that we, we have a forward. consensus that this is a fantastic thing and we look forward to uh, being able to proceed on it when Great. the time is right thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you uh, we appreciate the opportunity Appreciate so many uh, school board members being here today. Yes, we do. We got a whole board <coughs> in, in school system staff. Yes, a lot. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Alamance Burlington School System presentation on the fiscal year 17-18 budget. Dr. Harris. Good morning again. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Dennison, our finance officer, in, in just a minute. But over the past uh, year, or ever since Brian has become the, the county manager, he, Susan, Shannon, Dennison, and I have met on a regular basis to, to talk about our, our budget, where our money's going, what our needs might be. And we thought it would be a, a good idea to share with the commissioners um, all the revenue from where it comes and, and where it goes, how we uh, mix and match, if you will, federal, local, and, and state dollars. Uh, we start off uh, every presentation that we do uh, with our vision, and you'll see on one of the slides our uh, six strategic goals. We are very intentional about doing that. I think, uh, you know, everybody says your, what you value is where your money goes, and you take a look at someone's checkbook, and you'll know what's important to them, and what we're going to do today is show you our checkbook. Do Dr. Harrison, can I interrupt, please? You just say it, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> since I was on this vision plan committee, <laughs> one of about 50 people, I think it's worthwhile to, to read what this community came up with and how we envision our public school system. Why don't, why don't you read it, since I, you were a part of the, okay, part of the team you. that put that together, if be appropriate. And, and I, I just think that this, this, it's so important that we know where we want to go with our public education system. And this says it. There's a lot of work went into this. We envision a public school system that is a national model for its curriculum and community engagement to empower all Alamance County students with an equal opportunity for, and these are the really in, important things here, equal opportunity. And that means for everybody, regardless of zip code or census tract or neighborhood, equal opportunity for civic engagement, a meaningful quality of life, and skills for economic success for themselves and for our community. So, I mean, if our kids are successful, then the whole community is successful economically. So that's the bottom line. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon. Commissioner.
commissioners. I have, thank you for having us here. I have several slides that I'm gonna go through, kind of the details of the budget, what we're doing, how we're spending their money, uh, and a little bit more details than, than what the slides have. If you guys have any questions, feel free to speak up and I can stop. It may be later in the presentation, but um, feel free to speak up. Uh, this is a breakdown of the revenue that we receive by the source of funding. As you can see, the majority of our revenue does come from the state. The next largest portion of funds that we receive is from you guys and local sources, which is primarily you all and your county appropriation to us. From there, child nutrition, uh, fe the federal funds are next, shortly followed by child nutrition, as well as several smaller funds like our grant capital outlay and daycare funds. So explain the capital outlay, because when I hear the term revenue and then I hear outlay, those are two going in opposite directions, so. So capital outlay is going to, is kind of the token term for finance and how our funds laid out, uh, but that's going to be for all capital needs. So the million dollars that you allocated to our capital fund this year is in there, as well as uh, some lottery funds and some bond interest allocations that we have uh, remaining in our capital fund. So it's going to be for any building, capital, maintenance, um, large maintenance type of project. So some of that is in addition to the local? For, Correct, for, for yes. Part. So the million dollars of capital is what's going to be in there. And then the local, we typically use local is going to be more maintenance type of items. Uh, something considered like custodials or small supply, uh, small type of things that need repaired. If it's a large repair item or a large piece of equipment or something of that nature, it would be more capital outlay. So in some, there are some items that could kind of overlap between local and capital. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I have our strategic plan. As Dr. Harrison mentioned, we are very intentional when it comes to our vision and strategic plan. We do review the strategic plan every year before we come up with our budget and then throughout the year as we are spending money to determine does it tie back to our strategic plan? If it does tie that back to our strategic plan, in what way is it benefiting students um, in the most valuable we way we're able to with the funds that we have? Now I'm going to get into each fund, and with each fund, that's going to be the state, the primary funds for our operating. I'm going to go through state, local, federal, and grant funds, and how each of those funds are spent. Our state funds, 70% is spent on salaries, with 26% on bonus uh, on benefits. So that makes up 90% of 96% of our of our state budget is spent on people. That is the majority, as, as we looked at in the previous slide, the majority of the funds we received are state funds, and the majority of those funds are spent on our employees. Uh, you will notice that the largest chunk of all of the funds, it, the employees are primarily paid out of state funds. And the, there's a reason that we primarily pay for employees out of state funds as opposed to local funds or one of the other funds. When a staff member is paid out of state funds, the state's going to cover things. If there's a bonus for that year, the state's going to cover that bonus. Um, above and beyond the regular just dollars that they give us, they have kind of these other categories where if that person is paid through state funds, they're going to cover, they may cover that bonus, they cover longevity <coughs> payments, they cover if there's an annual leave payout when somebody might retire or resign. Uh, as well as workers' compensation. So there's some kind, those kind of fringe benefits that the state covers if, that, if an employee is paid out of state funds, where if the employee were paid out of local funds, we would be required to cover it with local funds. Um, and so it is beneficial and cost efficient for us to pay as many people out of state funds as possible. Uh, when it's something like supplies, there's no supplemental cost of having to buy supplies. If you know a book is $100, a book is $100, there's no extra expense that might come along with it, like there would be in salaries. Um, so our per people allocation for state as the time that this was done is 5,945. 
Um, our state funds, we receive projections and we receive the majority of our state funds in the beginning of the year, but there are still large chunks of state funds that we have not received and we don't know what they're going to be. Um, one example of that is going to be our transportation funds. We receive an 80% allocation to begin with and then uh, typically in December we're going to receive the remaining, we're going to know what that remaining allocation is. Um, so our state funds really, we receive revisions and we probably receive somewhere around 40 revisions throughout a year and our last revision is received <coughs> typically around the last week of June. So those funds just like some of the other funds, we never know to the penny until the year is closed out of exactly what those funds uh, will look like. But this is, I pulled it as of October, and so that's kind of where uh, these numbers and our projections. Some of the money we're able to project, some of it we're not. EC is another example of state funds that are still coming uh, that we aren't aware of. I have a question about this slide. Where you have capital outlay is uh, 59601 mm -hmm. um, So the state funds that you're addressing on this slide, that's um, separate from the lottery <coughs> money because the lottery is money that comes from the state. Yes. And it's spent on capital stuff, but it's not included in this slide because from your budgeting perspective, it's not the same thing. Is that right? Correct. From a budgeting standpoint, it goes in the big capital outlay. The capital that is listed on here, that's a great point, is going to be expenses over $5,000. So there could be a piece of equipment, say, that our exceptional children's department needs that is over $5,000, but it's able to be paid with out of state funds. Um, the career and technical education department could be another department where they're buying a larger item piece of equipment that they're able to use state funds for, but it's still considered a capital purchase. So there's a little bit of crossover there as well. The majority of our capital purchases would not be allowed out of state funds, but there are a couple of departments that, that can spend state funds. It's a complex finance. <laughs> it yes. is. Yeah. Very complex. Next, from our local funds, um, First, I wanted to point out that the county appropriation you'll see is a little bit different from the total. Uh, the county appro appropriation is 40681907 and then we have budgeted 900000 in fines and forfeitures. Again, the majority of our local funds are being sent, spent on salaries and benefits, uh, followed up by services and then supplies. The per people allocation out of local funds is 1850 could, could you give examples of services? Yes. So some of the services that we spend out of local funds, a large one is going to be our custodial contract. And I have a slide that goes more into detail on some what some of our services are. Um, services could be out of local funds. We do some specialized programs have services related to them. Our SROs are paid out of local funds. We have custodians, we have legal fees, and there are also some EC contracts. Uh, a lot, most of the time we typically try to hire EC employees. However, in some areas with the exceptional children, such as speech, um, nursing, there are times where there aren't enough and we end up having to contract and that would be that would fall under a service so some of those services are kind of interchangeable with staff if we're able to hire the staff can you give me a ballpark on how much you spend on legal services I don't have that number but I can get it to you are we paying for this, the entire school systems legal services or just some of it entire the entire I can get the legal services that would be great. Thank uh -huh. you. I would like that. How about services? I'd like you to explain the, uh, not services, mm -hmm. but uh, supplies. I hear all the time that teachers don't have the uh, <laughs> supplies that they need. Would sure. you explain what that means in that if we were given $4 million, I want to know what, where it goes. Absolutely. So supplies, what we do at the beginning of the year is there's an allocation that each of the schools get 
uh, a per people allocation of $70 per student that's projected to be at their school. So that projection we calculate in typically May and June to be, a, and it's the same projection that we use to allocate teachers for the following year. And we give them $70 per student, which is a combination of state and local money is where the combination of that comes from. However, it hits the local budget because again, it's more beneficial for us to pay for salaries out of state. Um, but the origination was kind of state and local. Is that for paper and pencils? That's going to be for paper and pencils. We direct the schools their first item to be able to purchase should be why consumables. Does, why, let me ask you something. Why does mm -hmm. teachers have to have to spend their own money to buy those supplies if the school is supposed to supply them? All I, the biggest complaints I hear is teachers spending money out of their own pocket because they can't get supplies. Something is not right in this uh, in this system. I if think we got that problem. Mm -hmm. If we're supplying seventy seventy dollars per student every year, somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do. We've actually raised that to seventy dollars the last two two years ago. And I think some of that is uh, we have a school improvement team at each school, uh, and they're responsible for the budget. And they're supposed to develop that local school budget openly. They're supposed to vote on that local budget. And I think some of that has to do with teachers always want a little bit more out of, yeah. the, out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, they're, they're, they want to do good. more bullets. Yes. Bullets. <laughs> I think, they need more yeah, well, I've been in, in Chapel Hill was probably spends more per pupil than anywhere else. I promise you they've got teachers spending money out of their own pockets. Yeah. Um, the board has been very um, aware of that and has advocated uh, the last two years that we that we do increase that. But, um, that I just hear so much talk from teachers about what they spend yeah. and I just wanted to clarify what what that covers. Thank you. I went down to Silver one time and they had a little separate room. I don't know if it's still down there or not. And they took me inside and they had stacks of crepe paper, uh, poster boards, you know, just had a whole room full of stuff. You know, that I think, I don't, I don't know where they got the money, with the PTA or, or, or PTO, whatever. But I don't know, is that still down at Silver? That room? You might know? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe go back down and look. But, that scan uh, was real active in that at one time. What mm -hmm. was it you and, and the supplies? Are you referring to Element Citizens for Education's yeah. classroom closet? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, there's a national statistic that teachers spend about $750 of their own money out of pocket to support their classrooms. A lot of that, again, reflects back onto what the state provides and the uh -huh. locals provide. And the classroom closet was designed to support teachers so they can go in and get those additional supplies without putting money out of their pocket. And it is still in operation. Good. We hope that's a perk Good. to our teachers. Thanks for asking. No, I would just like to point out that you know we have this vision of a national model of an education system and to get there you've developed six strategies and one of those is classroom and school supports and and that just begs the question is seventy dollars enough for a student I mean I, but seventy dollars doesn't go very far over a course of a whole year and, and so I just ask is that really enough to help accomplish carry out that particular strategy to accomplish that vision of a national model of an education system Bill, if I may, I, I just would like to add that we hear the same complaints, yeah. and it's not only teachers, but I would add that parents also contribute quite heavily um, at the beginning of each school year and throughout the year. Um, teachers often have trees with leaves, and everybody yeah. takes one and buys this or that, and um, so we're, not only are we providing that $70, but teachers and parents are providing supplies, money throughout the year. Yeah. Thank you. I would say that as a parent with children still in ABSS, I don't have anybody in elementary school anymore. Now mine are both in high school. I have one at Western High School who's a senior and one who's a freshman at Williams. And um, But when they were in elementary school, we used to go to Walmart and load up the cart with all the glue sticks and the colored pencils and the hunt for the right notebook that the teacher wanted us to get. and. Um, and all of that, and then um, often the children would I'd ask them six weeks later, what's going on at school? Are you using all that stuff? No, we're not using it. Or I'd talk to the teacher and they'd say, well, we put it on the list because we made it out as a team, but then we didn't end up using it. And I think that that is an area that um, 
is uh, open for being addressed by the Boots on the Ground administration, um, looking at that, because it is a burden. I mean, you, spent, you do. For a child in elementary school, you get handed the big school list, and it's easy $50, if not 100 or more, per child. And my heart does go out to those children who live in, um, in homes that they just don't have the money, and there are plenty of those in our county, too. Um, and also uh, asked about the uh, Element Citizens for Education classroom closet. And I asked, well, how come people are using that more? I asked some teachers who had contacted me with, to express their concerns about different things. And I was told that it was not convenient for them to be able to go. A lot of teachers have younger children. And it's, it's hard to get your little ones in and out of the car. You've got to deal with the stroller and the car seat and everything. And so, um, although I think that uh, ACE is a good idea and uh, is, a, is an avenue that some people take advantage of, <coughs> that there may be barriers to teachers being able to use that resource that um, maybe could be made more fruitful to those that you're trying to reach. Yeah, I would encourage you to have that conversation with Stephanie, the executive director, and I'll also tell you that they do offer what's called the apple cart delivery service, so teachers can actually order online and then they will deliver it to the school so they are aware of those barriers and they're really trying to work towards a more convenient um, opportunity for those teachers. Well, that would be, good. yeah, the apple cart's a really good idea and there were teachers who didn't know about it. Yeah. You know, and they're working the on that there. marketing. I've been coaching her on that. Okay. Well, great. All right. What else? Federal funds is the next area that to look at. Again, the majority of our federal funds are spent on people. Uh, the largest um, category of federal funds that we receive are Title I funds. These funds go specifically to schools with a high percentage of free and reduced lunch to be able to enhance the programs at their schools to specifically meet the needs of the students at those schools. And the next highest is going to be Title II, which is, gets into professional development and mentoring for teachers. And so a lot of the federal funds are tied up. EC is also another large um, category of federal funds that we receive for exceptional children and career and technical education. Uh, so there are several categories of federal funds that are specifically driven to what the federal government has reserved the funding for. And our per, per people allocation for federal funds is $648. Our grant funds, again, the largest percentage is in salaries and wages and benefits. Um, grant funds can be anywhere from grants from local agencies to our largest uh, grant funds that go into this category are going to be from Medicaid. All of our Medicaid reimbursements that for the services that we provide that Medicaid reimburses fall under these funds. It can be school, school and department grants, it can be local grants, it can be any sort of grant that we are able to receive or um, additional revenue. Also in the falling into this category would be things like when somebody rents out one of our facilities or when we're able, when we, the little bits of money that we end up generating, which are very small bits of money, but that would fall under this fund. This is also the big infamous fund eight, um, as for anything that would fall under here. Our per pupil, per pupil allocation for this is $330. Again, it is driven very specifically based upon uh, the grant awards that we receive. Now we're gonna, I'm going to take each of the categories that we just discussed and go into detail and uh, kind of break apart what is being spent in each of the categories as an all funds. This is going to be the funds that we just reviewed, which are state, local, um, federal, and grant funds. So at all funds and then specifically drilling into the local funds because since the, that's primarily what you guys fund. Uh, for all salaries and benefits, I listed a percentage. These percentages will, that are listed are going to add up to 100%. So this is the percentage of salaries and benefits that are spent in each of these categories. 
Our largest percentage by far is in teachers and teacher salaries. And then still the next several percentages get into certified instructional support and non-certified instructional support. Um, so the, the largest pot of money, as it should be, is spent in the classroom and working directly uh, with students. As you can see along the bottom, a large percentage of our salaries and benefits is tied up in retirement and hospitalization. With the retirement and hospitalization, we don't have a choice if we want to participate in the state retirement plan or the state health insurance. Um, we are required to participate in it, so those costs are kind of fixed based upon where, wherever the state uh, sets their rates. Are there any questions on the generic? I have just one quick or two, uh -huh. two maybe. Um, Extra duty pay, would that be the coaches? I know the coaches aren't paid much. They get a little bit. Do they get some money through the budget? It is. It's going to be partially extra duty pay. It's also going to be additional responsibility <coughs> stipends. Um, that would be, we have a very few occasions where we end up having a teacher teaching an extra section of something. Um, it also goes to pay for mentors, for teachers and principals, and pays for tutors. So it's a um, Along with that, the other supplementary pay is the other kind of one that's not detailed. That's going to be longevity, annual leave, um, bonuses, and any differentials uh, that the state might go. Before we leave this page, mm -hmm. I want to take the opportunity to heap praise and respect for the people who answer the phone at the schools, the receptionist, the one who has to buzz people in through the doors things like that. I've been there when waiting for a child to come for a dentist appointment or something and heard, you know, the phone call, their end of it and how it's going. And those people have a hard job <laughs> answering the phone. It is. It is a very busy job and they also, again, have other duties that end up, that they work on as well. Um, specifically drilling into looking at local, uh, the largest percentage that of local salaries and benefits does go to local supplements. Again, we try to get employees' main salaries to go on state funds. Um, so the largest percentage here is our local supplement, as well as the support services, um, and then specifically funding additional teachers that we aren't able to, we only have so many funds on the state to be able to get all of the teachers on. Um, and again, we still have additional teachers uh, that we do support out of local. So could you give other specific examples of types of teachers or is it kind of across the board? No, basically what I do, uh, what I do when I'm looking at the teachers, <coughs> I put the highest paid, longest years on the state because there's eligible for longevity. We might be able to pay them out of a position allotment. So really it's going to be the newer teachers that might be paid on the local funds to be able to um, save some money. The other thing um, I wanted to point out that uh, was a question of county staff is the difference between the local supplement um, out of the local fund and the local supplement on all salaries and benefits. There's a little bit of a difference there. And so I wanted to point out that difference is because we pay, first of all, any, anybody who's paid out of a federal fund, their supplement also has to come from a federal fund. Uh, and then in order to generate funding to, for EC, for the Exceptional Children's Department to be able to do more and have more resources, we kind of move around their local supplement. We still end up, we kind of trade them for their highest paid positions and they pay some of their local supplements out of their Medicaid reimbursement. Um, in the end, all of the funding that comes from the local supplements gets paid out, but in order to pay for their highest paid staff out of a position allotment, we're able to, to generate a little bit of extra revenue for them there. Um, so again, the local funding that is given for local supplements does all get to the local teachers. So it, would it be safe to say that um, you're doing some pretty good um, steering or maneuvering to help leverage, get the most use out of the federal and state funds before coming to the local funds. I spend a lot of time trying to <laughs> generate whatever funding that we can to be able to 
Um, like I said, those position allotments are very valuable to us. So, you know, as there are also talks in Raleigh of trying to do away with those position allotments, those do allow us a lot of flexibility in, in being able to um, work with our funding to make sure that we are able to do the most even and have, we want to be able to do the most and have some of the highest paid staff um, in terms of years of experience. Services, these are the service, this is the service breakdown for all funds. Primarily it goes into contracted services. This is kind of what I had mentioned before, the SROs, specialized programs, custodians. Uh, there are also some other services that fall under this, utilities being a large one that is also considered a service, some transportation, um, professional development. And the other fund here, the primary, primary item is going to be an indirect cost. When we have federal programs, we're able to um, charge to the program a small percentage of what it costs to be able to operate that federal grant. Uh, for example, you know, if we're hiring employees, the HR department is working towards that grant, or their paychecks are working towards that grant. So we're able to charge a small percentage towards indirect costs. And then there are some unbudgeted federal funds uh, that we have to leave in there for carryover into the following year because uh, the federal budget year is different than our budget year. So we have to make sure that we have funds in order to carry forward into the following budget year when the federal government passes their budget um, to be able to continue paying the salaries out of that. So there always has to be a little bit of unbudgeted funds for that reason. Since you have uh, transportation and the custodians on the same slide, uh, I wanted to ask a question about how the pilot program is going in the western zone, if you know or if Dr. Harrison can say. I know that the, the, the transportation, that having the bus drivers in the western zone was a big problem last year, and y'all were working on that with it that pilot program. Ahead, how is it going? Uh, it's actually going very well. Uh, we were very fortunate that a few of our custodians that we were able to hire had bus license, so was able to get them in the roles of driving buses and being service stores. We still have a pocket of folks that are waiting to be trained because we couldn't pull them all out of the schools and train them all at one time. So we're still waiting on the pocket of them to be trained. But reports I'm getting, schools are cleaner, custodians are very responsive to concerns that are addressed either by administration teachers and or students. Uh, fewer bus issues as far as buses being loaded, being double routed, triple routed. Uh, <clears throat> just overall, the efficiency has been uh, very much a plus. So we are very pleased with it, very excited. Uh, hopefully, we can work in the budget that we can move forward and incorporate more districts into this uh, same type of scenario. Great, that's good news. Thank you. Uh, locally, the primary um, <coughs> expense for services again goes to contracted service, with a second being utilities. Um, as we've just discussed with performance contracting, the hope is to be able to shift some of that utilities into being able to go back to work in our schools. Looking at supplies, supplies and digital resources, some of the supplies that are also purchased fall under, um, can fall under digital resources. Um, as teachers are teaching and evolving, some of the resources that they're teaching out of our digital as we're trying to work towards students having Chromebooks in their hands and being able to have some of those digital resources. We've also implemented to, in addition to supplies, schools are also getting an allotment for, it's, kind of, it's a, considered a textbook slash digital resource and they're able to figure out what's best for their school and what's needed to be able to educate the students in their school. Uh, some schools focus more on textbooks, some focus more on digital resource and a lot of that also depends on the grade and age span of the students. Uh, the operational supplies, um, that is going to be fuel for our facilities, repair parts, gas, tires, a lot of that's going to be uh, transportation type and maintenance type of budgets. Our local supplies, very similar to how our L fund supplies uh, look, again, primarily classroom supplies and digital resources with a portion of it being operational as well.
transfers. Um, this is another category that we end up getting. This, this is the funds that we transfer to the charter schools. Um, of the funds, we had kind of discussed a little bit in the Joint Facilities Task Force. This had, topic had come up, and I had pulled up 2.2 million of the 2.5 million is going to the charter schools in Alamance County. Uh, the remainder is going to charter schools outside of Alamance County from students that live within Alamance County. So that money follows the student, whether their school is within Alamance County or outside of Alamance County. And same with the schools in Alamance County, if somebody lived in Orange County, Orange County would be issuing um, the charter school in Alamance County a check. Um, so what's that rate based on? The rate's based upon our local Why is it the board? budget. Everybody. Each one's got a percentage of that total, right? Yeah, from so the it, federal, state, and the So local. we don't allocate from the federal and state. We just allocate the, from the <coughs> local portion, and then we take our ADM plus the ADM from all of the charter schools that we pay out from Alamance County students, whether they're within, whether the school's within Alamance County or in another county. We take the, eight, the student count of all of the students and come up with a per pupil number and then we pay it out in installments, um, increments of one tenth, um, similar to how we're funded mm -hmm. through the school year and we pay. So it's just the local portion that we're paying out. The state does allocate um, state and federal dollars to the charter schools. And sometimes state dollars get allocated to us and then move around and vice versa as part of those uh, revisions that we've received. Um, we had brought up local fund um, capital. Some of the items that we have in here, uh, we the fire truck for Grand High School would be an example of what we were we received the funding for specialized programs and the fire academy. Uh, that would be a capital purchase that we paid out of local funds to be able to purchase a fire truck for Grand High School's fire academy. <coughs> So that's the end, uh, the last portion of our current expense budget. Before we move on to capital, do you have any other questions related to local? All right, so then this is the, the breakdown of our capital revenue. Uh, the primary, um, the largest source of funding that we have for the capital revenue this year <coughs> is our, the lottery. Um, Second being the county appropriation that you guys provide for us. And then there's a little bit of bond interest and then the interest that we are able to receive out of what we have in our bank accounts. Bond interest allocations, we have a little bit of interest left that we, are out, we have allocated to specific projects, um, some of what, uh, which are in progress. Good. So I'm having trouble understanding again kind of similar to uh, capital outlay as a source of revenue. So when I see that term interest, I think of that as being an expense that we pay, not revenue coming in. So this is interest that has accumulated from what's in the bank account. So this is because of the, the, the funds are invested during the time period between when, oh, okay. when, when so they're received and when they're spent. So it's like interest income. Basically. Yeah. And I believe the board has uh, voted at uh, some point to allow those proceeds, the interest, to be reinvested into projects uh, for the school system. I remember that. Uh, this is our capital outlay budget for 2017-2018. Um, a large part of that is architects. Uh, in order for the Graham High School STEM program, we received a very large grant uh, from the Golden Leaf Foundation, there was a matching component to it. So we put um, some of the capital outlay funding into the matching component uh, that was able to get us that grant to be able to do some of the renovations at Graham High School. Uh, several different, uh, some, some equipment, and uh, we have some, as you notice at the bottom, for repairs as needed. Those are the type of items that we don't necessarily know 
what's going to come up. We don't know what boiler might uh, need repair. We don't know sometimes until we go to turn them on what, what issues might come up. So we always keep a little bit uh, to be able to in reserve for what might happen that we're not aware of. Put some dwell just a minute if we can mm -hmm. on the roofing, the $35,000 for roofing. Um, actually, I'll hold my question for a moment. Let, let me let you get through your lottery budget slide sure. and then we'll talk about that. Thank you. No problem. And this just that I have brought to my attention, this is the um, million dollars that you all allocated. This is the breakdown of that, um, not necessarily our whole capital outlet. It would be helpful to have totals on these slides. So. Um, so the lottery funding for capital, uh, as you can see, we've and we've had several meetings over the changes in lottery funds uh, by year. Our highest being in 2010, 2011, it being just over three million dollars. Last year we received 1.7 million, and we do have unallocated in the lottery account that we have not spent. As of June 30th, we have 2.5 million in there for projects to be able to spend. We have been spending more in lottery projects than we've been receiving, so that's kind of our well, fund balance in the lottery um, would be comparable. Uh, so we that is decreasing on an annual basis. Um, but that is ask a question about the, <coughs> these numbers mm -hmm. for each year this is what came to the county and then we allocated to you as you requested them or is these is what was or what were what were available to us from the lottery program this would be what would be available okay so it's not what uh, you requested from us to spend mm -hmm. okay. and, th and that's why there's that two and a half million dollar uh, like fund Cushion. balance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Um, and as you guys know, several of the items in terms of the decrease in lottery funds, it is partially because <coughs> of it is being used to fund other um, initiatives at the state level. At our level, we are, this is what we're spending um, on capital <coughs> revenue. I have a quick question about the lottery funding. Is that allocated to all the school systems equally across the state? Does the, the whoever's in charge of the lottery at the state level, do they say, okay, everybody gets a certain percentage, or is it up to the individual school system to request it? So, so much is allocated to us, and then we have to request it. So in order for us to get lottery funds, it's a little bit of a process. We have to have board approval by our board. Um, you all have to re approve it, and then it goes to DPI. DPI has, a, has to approve it, see the plans, um, and then they will allocate it the following month is when we'll get it. So when we make a request, it can be a few months down the road, which is why when we're trying to do summer projects, we might request summer projects in March to be able to make sure that hopefully by the June, we actually are able to draw down some of those lottery funds. At some point, I was looking at the comparison between ABSS and surrounding counties and how much lottery money we got, and we got more than a lot of the surrounding counties. And I think that's a reflection on you and your work and the administration that y'all go get that money, you know, go get that lottery money and, and don't just sort of sit back. And I think that's really good and I appreciate that. Uh -huh. How many schools do we have? 39? 36. 36? Including 36. In the, I guess we have 36 including uh, what would be the middle college that's housed at ACC. So um, 1.7 million divided by 36. <laughs> Isn't very much per school. It's like 40, 47,000 maybe that roughly. It does. It makes it difficult to be able to do large projects. Um, and one of the things we allocate out of capital every year, in addition to it, about 400,000 comes out to pay down CTAC uh, for the debt service on that. And then we also allocate the summer painting projects that we do every year. Capital outlay is how, or lottery funds is how we've kind of designated that as a recurring to be able to continue that initiative. So the point I was trying to make was, and you reinforced it, <laughs> that it's not a panacea for meeting the capital needs of our schools, the lottery program. Um, 
Our summer 2017 lottery project, um, the challenging part about some of our lottery projects is they typically cross over years, so we might have a little bit paid out of one fiscal year and a little bit paid out of the next fiscal year. So in some ways it's easier to look at it on a summer basis. Um, again, uh, this, is, this is the breakdown. Uh, a large portion of it went to SeaTech and then painting uh, being the two largest projects. And then we had some tennis court repairs, track repairs, and several other uh, repairs that were completed over summer 2017. And some of that, like I said, was spent out of each year's budget. Okay, let's um, talk a little bit about the, um, the roof repair and replacement because uh, the so y'all had requested $125,000 from the county and then so you add up the, you got 120, took 125 from your lottery budget and then $35,000 from the county capital outlay budget. So I just want to, this is a very important question to me. Do y'all have enough money in ABSS to keep up with the roof situation? No? Bruce, that's a loaded question. Yes, yeah. it is a very loaded question. <laughs> uh, and uh, Mr. Lashley definitely knows about roofs. Yeah. Uh, the roof schedule to replace roofs in the system is sort of, sort of fallen by the wayside to a lot of ways. We've done what we've had to do. And what we really got to get started is a true roof replacement system. Uh, we've had conversation about the roofs that we have failing that our attorneys are involved in. Uh, so, you know, that's. I've seen four and five million dollars for that project alone to fix those roofs and repair those roofs. It's not going out to be a this is a squadron engineer that's put out there. What I expect for you to see in the next capital outlay request and uh, in the future in our uh, task force meetings, this force is talk more about how do we want to tackle this elephant that's in the room because it is a huge elephant. It is a huge expense. At one of our high schools it's got the Florida style buildings, it's about $40,000 to replace just one of those buildings. Uh, you take a self contained school such as Broadview, you're talking probably one and a half to $2 million just to replace that roof. So, what we take with our roofing money now is we take our roofing money and make the roofs last as long as we possibly can. There's different coatings now that we can put on the constantly for coating roofs, and when we have a major leak, we are doing what we have to do to make that major repair. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, also, well, what's going on with your lawsuit against your roofer? Because y'all, as I understand from the newspaper, hired some roofers and it didn't work out so well. And then there's uh, complications that continue okay, that's to the, unfold. That's the six roofs I was addressing there. Uh, there was a warranty issued on the roofs. The company issued the warranty to the Martin business and the company bought them out. So it just goes this little chain of things. So, uh, Dr. Harris and myself had a conversation with our attorneys last week. This process is moving forward, and that's where that around four million dollars coming from. Some of the engineers that's worked on some of that work for us. So once we can get that to a point that we know how much money uh, we're going to be awarded for the warranties, I promise you we'll be back into another conversation to say there's a gap. You know, if, uh, Commissioner, how do you want us to make up this gap? How, where are we going to make it up at this school year or this summer to complete those projects? Well, I expect that y'all are talking with your attorneys, too, about addressing the damages from the faulty roofs. It's not only the roof itself that leaked and the fixing that, but it's also the flooring that had to be replaced, the ceiling tiles, yes, and all the other down things. Counting the ceiling tiles, counting flooring, counting everything, all that will be put into the major claim. And then, you know, you know as well as I do, it's kind of left up to what the warranty says and what the claim will be at the end. Uh, the warranty says, in my opinion, it says we're covered. Both attorneys agree that we're covered. It's just to what extent because we are on the backside of the 15 year warranty. What about mold? I noticed that y'all don't have anything budgeted for mold. And uh, social media chatter says that mold is a problem. I'm sure you've gotten calls about that. What, what's your response to questions about mold in the school system? Okay, if someone calls and says they are, see the possibility of mold in view or anything that would resemble it. Uh, I do have a gentleman on staff or safety officer that can go out and he checks and he looks. If it's something that we need to call in the company to remediate, we will do that. And the, fortunately the custodial cleaners that we use now are certified to remove mold. 
so we can use them to come in on weekends or the evenings to take care of that situation. Uh, a lot of times we find out it's what it appears to be and what it may be is two different things. But either way, we do get it cleaned up. We spend a little extra time and, and we do it without the presence of students. So that type of work takes place in the afternoons or on the weekends. But you don't have a line item, uh, an account to put roof money in for roof repairs. It just a per job as it comes along. Right? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know how you start it, but someday, you know, there's always a starting point for everything. And uh, I know back when Susan was down at Duke all the time, I I would just walk around and talk to people about the various functions. They told me they said the guy that. You know, they have a lot of flat roofs down there. <clears throat> he told me, he said, if you put, I forgot what he said, X amount of dollars in, in a fund, in, in a budget every year, based on square footage of your system, that you'll never have a major uh, roof repair. Yeah, that's, that, that sounds good. It sounds nice. I don't know where you start, and I don't know <laughs> what fund. What, that's what, probably what, true, Tim. Yeah, I would think so. True. Yeah. So. Well, and I think that maybe that's, you know, I'm glad you brought it up because really that's a part of what we're talking about starting with the roof replacement plan. Right. And, you know, Brian, Susan, um, we probably need to sit down and talk about one, you know, what, what would that number look like? And two, who's going to house that number? Who's going to house that money? Is it something that the county wants to put as a line item that we know we're going to pull from? Or is it something the county wants to put in a line item they're going to give to us that we're going to put in the line item? But uh, I think if Brian's okay with that, we can get together. And I think it falls right in line with what I've, I've talked to a couple of commissioners about about us doing some financial planning for our capital needs because we have we're responsible for their roofs, our own roofs, courts roofs, ACC's roofs. We have a lot of roof yeah, needs that we're plan. statutorily yeah. responsible for. I think we're reaching a point where, as a county government, we need to work with folks like Todd and Shannon uh, to plan how best to do this, what money needs to cover these. And how do you set something up annually to avoid big major uh, problems? So uh, I'm sure in the next uh, couple of weeks we'll sure. be talking with you guys about how we'll how we'll do that, and I'll be bringing something to the board. You can have more problems inside a building from leakage through that roof sure. than anything. Yes. If you can keep those roofs secure and, and waterproof, you'll save money in the long run. And it's a guaranteed issue. I mean, it's, yeah. it's coming. So it's coming. That's right. Yeah. So you know, I think it's good. Is it feasible to get the square footage of our buildings yes. broke down, county sure. schools, and so forth, as far as the roof? Roof square footage mm -hmm. for uh, schools, ACC, courts, and county building. Those are our our responsibilities as county government. We can do that. I know that the county manager has been working on a facilities maintenance plan for the county. Does the school system have its own facilities maintenance plan? that's up and running and ongoing? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we, have, we have a maintenance plan that, uh, especially dealing with HVAC, your, your heating and cooling as far as rollers, chillers, that's way major expenses. Uh, we also have a plan with a roost. Uh, we're on a roost at least every six months, cleaning them with debris. So we have a plan that we're taking care of as much as you can see as fast as you can see it. I might remind us that um, of the six strategies in your strategic plan, one is facilities. I mean, it's very important. All right. Here are some pictures of some of the completed 2017 projects with some carpet removal and painting. I know you guys have all been in our schools and seen the difference of what some of these I, while just painting might just be paint, it makes a huge difference in the school. And same with the carpet removal into the, the tile replacement with allergies and um, aesthetics. Um, we did have some re roof repairs and replacements. Uh, the Graham High School Science Lab, we had some awnings. We also had some track repairs and tennis repairs uh, that had become um, real safety issues for the students. <coughs> Some of our projects that we've already started uh, getting in the works for 2018 as projects are painting several of the schools. Uh, the last school, as you'll notice, says one more. We're trying to determine between two schools based upon um, some other information and work that might be done that we're waiting um, 
to decide which of the last schools will be done, but one additional school. There will also be windows um, at Turrentine, some work um, done at Western Middle, uh, Garrett Hoffields roofs, and a relocation of the pump and tank for the well from Western High School to Sylvan to be able to uh, use some of the equipment that we have without having to purchase any new to make repairs. If there's any other questions. I appreciate the, the yeah. report, I really do. Um, I've always thought that educating our kids is a team sport and it's important that the Board of Education and the Board of Commissioners are on the same team even though we have different roles to play. And, and of course, there's, we have to hold each other accountable, but uh, we all have to work together to make sure that our kids get the best education. Absolutely. And Brian and Susan, Susan have been very helpful in working through the process and helping with this as well. Does anybody else have any Thank questions you, or anything? Ma Madam Chair, can I just make one quick point of clarity? You asked earlier about the legal expenses, and I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, we are a member of the North Carolina School Board Association and consequently a member of the School Board Trust. So when we have a lawsuit, we submit that case to them and if they approve it, which they typically do, then they pay all of our legal defense. So I just didn't want you to think that we were using local funds to pay legal defense fees. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That's with respect to the roof uh, issue, Tony? Um, I don't think that's actually a legal oh, okay. bill, uh, yeah. case right. yet. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, and I would add, uh, Dr. Harrison's done some great work with having internal staff uh, prepare, for example, contracts. He has a template that they use so that when we submit contracts to legal staff, they, uh, they don't have to review the whole thing, but they can review the parts that they need to see. So there is some internal um, efforts being done to reduce legal fees. Unfortunately, you can't control sometimes the iteration in which legal necessities come at you. But, um, well, we but I, I, I mainly just didn't want you to think that we that our legal defense was being paid by local funds. So that, that's been some area of confusion in the past. So thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. That was a very good presentation, very thorough. We put you through your paces. You did a good job. Thank yes. you. And Madam Chair, if I could say uh, we we uh, appreciate uh, Shannon and Dr. Harrison and Todd uh, spending so much time putting this together for the board and uh, being very open. They have. They've really given you a lot of information. It is a very complicated budget. Uh, they've been very open with us, and uh, we certainly appreciate that and look forward to working with them on uh, how to plan for the future uh, as partners with them. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Absolutely. And that's definitely what we're looking for is a partnership with the school system in recognition of how important it is to all of us to have a successful public school system. Okay. Um, annual audit presentation by Mr. Lee of Martin Starnes & Associates. Welcome, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Brian Lee. I'm a CPA and manager with Martin Starnes and Associates. And uh, I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for allowing us to perform your audit again this year. Uh, it's a relationship that we don't take for granted and uh, look forward to many years in the future. Thank you. Uh, some of the highlights from the audit. Uh, we issued an unmodified opinion in the opinion letter in the front of your financial statements. That is a clean opinion. That's the one you're after. Um, this is thanks to your staff, uh, Susan, Andrea, everyone else in finance, uh, everyone at DSS, Kelly's team, uh, they were really great to work with and we were on a tight timeline this year to get your report into the LGC for uh, debt issuances and so everyone really pulled together and, and made the uh, audit as painless as an audit can be. Uh, this is the general fund summary of revenues and expenditures over the past two years. See that revenues have increased from 144.7 million to 145.8, so just under a 1% increase. Um, expenses have increased from 137 million to just over 144, so that's about a 5% increase. Uh, still a positive in impact on net position and fund balance in the general fund. So here's the total fund balance for general fund. You can see that it increased by about $1.7 million this year, up to just over $48 million. And over the past two years, uh, fund balance has increased by $10 million. Available fund balance is a metric that the LGC looks at across the state for all counties and municipalities. Uh, you begin with your uh, total fund balance in the general fund, of just over $48 million. Uh, we subtract non-spendable items, so that would be um, inventory or long-term receivables, in which case you don't have any. 
Um, we also subtract stabilization by state statute of just over 11 million. This is another calculation in and of itself. And that leaves us with available fund balance of just under 37 million. And this is an increase of about 1.2 million from last year. So continuing on with the available fund balance calculation, uh, the LGC says that about 8% of your expenditures in the prior year equates to about a month of expenditures. And so uh, we had about 25.5% of available fund balance of your 2017 expenditures and transfers out of the general fund. Um, so once again, about three months. If you were to lose all of your funding for some reason, uh, the county could carry on exactly as it did this year for just over three months. Uh, unassigned fund balance in the general fund of uh, just over 26 million. So this is reducing, this is taking out all of your committed, assigned, and restricted fund balance. Uh, total general fund expenditures for the year of over 144 million. Yes, sir. Uh, on that, um, the, the amount of fund balance taken out that's committed, would that include what's committed in our the current year's budget? If you if you appropriate out? from um, fund balance into your current year budget, then that does include that. It would. If you encumber anything in your next year's budget, then so that's I'm, yeah, I'm talking paid. about the. Cause we, I think what he's talking about is. Are you talking about for 17, 18, yes, what, we've, yes. what we've budgeted yes. of fund balance? Right. That, that, I don't, to balance the budget. To right. balance this current year's budget. Is yes, it that is a restricted fund balance item. Okay. So, so if we, if, if uh, actuality happened in 27, 2018, as we budgeted, our fund balance would go down to 18.26%. Um, that's where it's set at the end of June 30th, 17. Yes, yeah, so we used uh, approximately $7 million in fund balance to balance 1718's current right. current mm -hmm. budget. Right. So uh, if, if all that happened and we went down to 18.26%, uh, 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 we would actually be lower than that if uh, we spent all our fund balance that we budgeted this year, too. Yes. And so you can see that unassigned as a percentage of general fund expenditures in 17. Uh, has dropped to 18.2 percent, but um, one big factor in that is the uh, increase in expenditures that we showed. It's about 5 percent increase and uh, 4 percent decrease in, on the sign. <coughs> uh, the top three revenues in the general fund for the year, ad valorem taxes at 53 percent, this property taxes on real and uh, personal property, local option sales taxes at 19 percent that come from the state, restricted intergovernmental at 17 percent. Uh, these are franchise, utility, taxes, um, and other revenues make up about 11 percent. And some of those other revenues are other taxes and licenses, unrestricted intergovernmental funds, permits and fees, sales and services, investment earnings, and other miscellaneous revenues. <coughs> so ad valorem taxes are the uh, largest portion of your revenues. You can see that it increased about a million dollars from last year. Local option sales taxes are the second uh, largest group, and it increased from 27.6 million to 28.1. And this is a good indicator of the economic activity in your region uh, that's flowing down from the state. Restricted intergovernmental revenues dropped from 26 million to about 24.6. Uh, this includes uh, federal and state funding in the form of grants. Your top three expenditures in the general fund. Uh, education at 29 percent, human services at 25 percent, public safety at 23, and all other expenses make up about 23 percent. So your total, your top three uh, expenses in the general fund add up to 111 million. So on the education, that's including our support to ABSS and to Alamance Community College? Yes, it is. But not debt service. Not debt service. That's right. If you add debt service, I think we're close to 33 percent yeah. of our entire budget. So some other expenses in the general fund uh, that fall into that other category are general government, transportation, culture and rec, um, economic and fiscal development, and your debt service. And, and public safety, is that all um, sheriff and detention center? I think that also sheriff includes detention. emergency services. Emergency services, oh, okay. EMS, as well as CECOM. Um, so education expenditures have increased from 39.8 million up to just under 42 million. 
and that's mostly due to capital outlay and uh, project expenditures. Human services is right on par with uh, last year at about 35.7 million. Uh, not much change there for the two last two years. Public safety expenditures have increased from just over 30 million to 33.5 million, and this is also um, a reflection of capital outlay and major purchases in that department. And the last fund I have here is the landfill fund. Uh, operating income in 2016 of just under 450,000, and that is up to over 500,000 this year. Uh, investment in capital assets uh, increased about 700,000. Which, which plays a role in unrestricted net position. So unrestricted net position did come down a little bit um, by about 200,000, but total net position did still increase by about 500,000. And there's, uh, there's two points I'd like to, um, to discuss with you um, about the upcoming year. There's a slight change in the way that direct benefit payments are go going to be presented. They're not going to uh, flow through your report anymore. So in the very back of your report is the schedule of expenditures of federal and state awards. Um, it's in the compliance section. And that shows direct benefits that come from the state through to your citizens and don't necessarily pass through uh, county funds. These are going to be taken off that schedule. So what that does is, is really reduce the amount of federal, fund, federal and state funding that it looks like you're receiving. So that changes the way that we do our single audit and uh, how many programs we have to test. So and we can't really predict what next year is going to look like at this point. But if we were under these um, rules for this year, we tested five programs. If we had been under this new set of standards, we would test nine. So it is going to change the audit process a little bit. Um, and so you might also see some additional engagements coming down from the state of how to test Medicaid specifically and some of the other DSS programs. So just be on the lookout for that. But uh, one thing I can tell you is we're all over that. We're talking to the state auditor. Um, we've already had discussions with Susan about getting set up for that and making sure that the county's ready for an audit of some programs that maybe haven't been tested in the past. Um, the second point is uh, the change in OPEB, other post-employment benefits. Uh, in the past, that liability has been determined by an actuary, discounted back, and amortized over 30 years. So every year we pick up one year of your OPEB liability. Next year, the entire liability uh, comes on to the books across the state. So it's going to be a very, very large number that affects only your balance sheet. You won't have to do anything with budgeting, but um, your, your balance sheet in the front two schedules, exhibits A and B, will drastically change. Um, you'll have a much bigger liability on the books for OPEB. So it's just something Would to be aware of. Would you go back a slide? Uh, sure. the, yeah, yeah, the enterprise fund. Uh, sure. Brian, can you explain? I should know this, I'm not going to lie to you, but <laughs> the total net position, $22 million, explain to us what that is. That's what your is that's your retained earnings. What that number entails is it's all of the capital equipment that the landfill possesses, so the building, the land. Um, it's not just money sitting in a bank account right. for them. Um, what we have to do is set aside money for the event that the landfill were to close, and we would have to maintain. The assets would then be sold as far as the equipment, and those funds would be put aside to keep maintaining that um, landfill closure for about 20 years. Yeah, and one of the largest expenses in the fund, in your fund statements, is for uh, landfill closure and post-closure costs. So those costs are being accumulated right now before it's actually closed. <laughs> and then your portion, your $22 million that you have right now, um, kind of locked up in capital assets is at uh, $13.7 million. Great. So I welcome any other questions that you have. Would be good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee, very much. Thank you very much. All right. The budget Thank amendment you. for the school's capital reserve fund. Good morning, again, Commissioners. Good morning. Before you is a transfer request to move $1,549,518.80 from the general fund to the school's capital reserve fund. What this is coming from is in fiscal year 16, I'm sorry, yes, 16 17. These are the revenues in excess of their debt service from Articles 40 and 42. And we just need to go ahead and transfer those funds to a capital reserve fund. 
that will be used at a later date for debt service or additional renovation projects. So moved. Second. Great. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any Thank opposed? You. Thank you. And these are funds that when we're talking with ABSS about how to start long range planning for their capital issues that they have like the roofs, we'll be talking about these funds as well as lottery as well as our annual allocation that we give them every year. So this will be a part of that conversation too. Super. Okay, county manager's report. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have uh, two items to talk with you about. The first one, uh, as uh, Commissioner Bird mentioned, this does require your uh, some action from the board. So as a board, uh, the commissioner's being asked to appoint one commissioner uh, to serve on the nominating committee for Cardinal Innovations, as you have, I'm sure, seen in the press and seen re uh, releases from Association of County Commissioners, the state has uh, assumed operations of Cardinal Innovations and disbanded the uh, board that had been in place. So uh, the state is asking that uh, each county in the 20 county catchment area appoint one commissioner that will serve on a nominating committee that will be involved with selecting who the new board for Cardinal uh, will be. So uh, today uh, we have to do this by Friday, December the 8th. Um, and we'd like to see if the board would be willing today to, uh, via a motion, appoint someone uh, to be uh, on this nominating committee. Uh, the nominating committee will meet the week of December 11th. The state is moving very quickly. Uh, County Attorney Albright has reviewed a lot of information from the association as well as from Secretary Cohen about uh, this process. Uh, I'm sure he can attest they're moving very fast. And uh, so if it's possible today to have the board appoint someone to serve on this nominating committee, then we will take care of making sure the public knows how to nominate folks. We'll put that on our website and get it out there because there is an email address that people can submit <coughs> names uh, to nominate. So um, this time, if it's uh, any questions that uh, the county attorney or myself can answer, uh, ideally we'd like to ask that you, through motion, appoint a member to the nominating committee. In those uh, nominations, they're going to go directly to either the association or to the, the secretary, the secretary's website. office, I believe, right? There's so they're, not, they're, they're not coming to us just because they're from Alamance County. That's correct. It's, uh, it looks like it's through the association. And, and the board has specific makeup. So, I mean, it requires one county commissioner, somebody with a background in mental health, some with a background in insurance, and, and so on. Well, that was, the, that was the old board. I'm not sure what that is. No, no, that's statutorily required. <clears throat> but the, uh, as far as the nominating committee goes, no, the nominating committee needs to be one commi 20 commissioners, one from each county. That's correct. Right. And then but, but the, you can um, self-nominate. Yes. You can you send want your, your letter, letter, your resume to the, <laughs> well, I'd, to the website. I'd be happy to serve on the nominating committee, uh, but I might suggest that uh, we appoint an alternate, an alternate uh, because, I mean, there's a lot of things on my calendar next week. We don't know when that nominating oh, committee is yeah, going to go. Correct. And that might be true for everybody. If, if the board chooses to do that, uh, appoint a uh, uh, member as the official member of the nominating committee and an alternate, we'll let the Association of County Commissioners know, and uh, I'm sure that'll be fine because they're, they're moving very quickly and they really want a representative from each board of commissioners in their area. So. How about Amy? Do you want to be the alternate or the, the nominee? Well, I think that Bob is better qualified to be the, the nominee with all of his experience and the uh, Healthcare field, um, okay. but if uh, needed to be, I would be glad to be an alternate. That, okay. that would be good. For is there a consensus from the board yeah. that uh, it sounds I, like I, I Bob is the yeah, uh, official good. nominee? Uh, excuse me, Commissioner Bird and Commissioner Gailey, Chairman Gailey, will be the uh, alternate. alternate. Okay. Broke that camera. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And the other item I have is I know we've had a lot of uh, inquiries into county facilities of late, uh, in particular uh, Peak property over off of Woody Drive and the Kernodal property uh, over in East Burlington. And what we have, we've had lots of folks asking about uh, acquiring both of them. And I've talked with a number of the commissioners about this. And what I'd like to do, our, the county manager's office has a performance management goal for this fiscal year to bring a process for facility planning to the Board of Commissioners. Um, and I would like to do that at the December 18th commissioners meeting. I'll come and outline a process. I won't have a plan on the 18th. I won't have an official plan for what we should do, but I'll have a, 
uh, some things, I'll make some recommendations to you that steps we need to take to come up with that plan. Um, and this, these, a formalized plan, I think, will help us make thoughtful decisions on accepting properties. So the next time someone comes to the county and says, I have a, a property I want to donate to the county, I think we need to have something in place that helps guide us deci deciding should we take it or should we not, as well as disposing properties. We have a number of uh, properties that we're not using efficiently and we may want to get rid of. Um, and I know the board has already taken uh, bids on the Cronodal property, but you've tabled that for 30 days. And what I'd like to ask that, uh, and I'll talk about this more on the 18th, um, what I'd like to ask that you do is you give us some time to plan and come up with what's the highest and best use of all of our properties, including the ones that people are actively interested in right now, and then we can decide what's best uh, to do. So, um, you know, I don't need you to take any action at this point. I just want to let you know I'm coming on the 18th with some proposals about what we need to do next. And uh, as we get continued calls from folks either wanting to buy our properties, if it's okay with the board, if there's a consensus, we will tell them we're, we're, we're formulating a plan. And we will have uh, some guidance for the commissioners on how to make these decisions. So uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. But if this sounds reasonable, I just ask that we wait to take any formal action on disposing of or accepting properties until we get something in place. And I don't think it's going to be a plan process that takes forever for us to do. But uh, there is some time involved. So. Well, I support planning, and I think this is a long time coming that we need to do. Yeah, a lot, lot of times, of we, in the past, we have turned down property that was going to cost the county so much money to take. That place in Mebbin, I can't remember what that they offered to give it to us, and uh, uh, Chick at the time turned it down. You remember that that situation, what it was? I remember the, the uh, that particular uh, turn down item, but I don't remember the details about it. Well, I think we if didn't you take it. If you have, uh, if you know where you're trying to go with your facilities, you know if it's be if it's wise to take the offer, yeah. or or to say no, that really that's going to be worse for us than if we didn't take. It. So uh, that's where I'd like for us to be. That's right. I, I'd, I'd like for us to be in a place where we know where we're going with our buildings, and and frankly, it will include at the, in the end where ABSS is going, where ACC is going, where the courts are going, because we are financially responsible for all of that. Uh, but I think we can we can work together with them to do was it. Was that 3C that you're talking about? I think it was. Where the, 3C, oh, yeah. The battery. Yeah. Where they didn't move in or didn't work out. Yeah. I vaguely remember. I saw how it came to my mind. Do, do we need to take action on the motion that we passed last time about the 30-day uh, tabling of... That um, goes to the 18th, or, I think. Is that still within 30 days? We're, we're, we, I believe we'd still be... Um, you still... You still can make the decision that you could have made at our last meeting, right. to accept it, reject it, or postpone it. Well, we, well, we made a motion to table yeah. it for 30 days, right. and I just want to make sure that we're not in violation of what we passed. Is no. it? Okay. Yeah, and we can bring it back up then, I and, guess. And Whatever that decision is will be made on the on the 18th. I, 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 won't have, I want to make sure that I'm clear with the board. I won't have an answer for what I think is the best thing to do with Cronodal right. or Peak on the 18th. Right. In fact, I'll probably ask you to wait longer to do right. anything with either property. Uh, but what I will have is the process that I want us to go through to figure it out. Um, so, and you know, I think it would be, I think that's the best course of action to let us get some, uh, some concrete things in place. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any commissioner's comments? Well, first off, I would like to say thanks to the board for giving me the opportunity to serve as your chairman. It's been a pleasure. I think we've done some really good things in the county. And I want to congratulate Amy, and I know she's going to do a good job. Yeah, I'll try. Thank you. The truth is, you'll live longer, and your wife ought to fake us. I know. <laughs> she already has. <laughs> Well, I would like to congratulate Amy as well. I think she'll do an excellent job and appreciate the background that she brings to that your position now. Yes. So thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, report on a couple of things. Uh, last week I attended um, a, a joint meeting of three steering committees at the uh, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. I chaired one of those uh, meetings. We, we met separately. Uh, the three steering committees were the Public Education Steering Committee, uh, the General Government Steering Committee and the one that I chair, the Health and Human Services Steering Committee. We met separately for an hour and then we met for the rest of the day, it was almost all day, uh, as uh, the three committees together. 
and we heard a, a variety of speakers, very interesting speakers on public education, on early childhood education, and how important it, it is to invest resources into pre-K education and the return that you can get on that. Um, Secretary Mandy Cohen spoke to the group about the, uh, the, the, the whole cardinal situation and what she was planning to do that we just uh, heard about. And there are other speakers too, but one I wanted to point out was um, our Family Justice Center uh, under Cindy Brady and um, the Family Justice Center in uh, Greensboro did a, an hour presentation. Uh, what's that director's name, Susan? That's, um, I can't think of her name. But Cindy and, and the director from Greensboro did an outstanding job at presenting the benefits of having Family Justice Centers uh, take care uh, to uh, treat or um, counsel and, and deal with the issues of um, victims of domestic violence and, and um, sexual assault and uh, non-fatal strangulations and those sorts of things. And because uh, a lot, there aren't that many family justice centers and, and so we're, we're models for the state and we have people coming from all over looking at our family justice centers. And it made me very proud to be in the room while they were uh, presenting. And then uh, I got to experience um, one of our elementary schools last week. I was invited to uh, read to a group of students at uh, Yoder Elementary in Mebane. And we have some tremendous things going on in our schools. I, I got to uh, um, witness some uh, excellent teaching, teaching there. Just, these were second graders. And it just makes me feel so hopeful for our future, seeing what's going on. Awesome. Anyone else? Okay, well then we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alanance County Commissioners Meeting. Meetings of the Commissioners Board occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month is at 9 a.m. and the second meeting of the month is at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Time Warner's public access channel on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at 10 p.m. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com. Please visit our website for more information about watching meetings online. For technical questions regarding this meeting's online or television broadcast, please contact our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. Please note that this address is for technical questions only. Questions regarding the content of commissioners' meetings may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. Click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes of past meetings, access agendas, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can send mail correspondence to the commissioners by sending it to the Alamance County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting.